Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church this morning. We're so glad that you could come and join with us. There's lots to see and hear this morning. We hope that you'll sit back, enjoy, feel a part of it, and that you'll also be blessed by the upcoming song from some of our children. Keep an eye out for anyone you might know. Jesus loves us, big or small, His love will never end. When we're weak, He is our strength. We are always safe with God. When we feel lost, He is always close, cause we everyone it's great to be at church with you all it was so wonderful to see the kids uh, signing to Jesus love this morning it's actually a song we've been looking at for a while and because we can't sing at church we have taught the kids some basic sign language to be able to express themselves in worship so well done to those um, kids that got involved and thank you for doing that um, if you're at church today kids you can go out in one minute we're actually going to be looking at a different passage this morning than the rest of the church is looking at. We're stepping into Luke 15, 1 to 7, which is the parable of the lost sheep. You might have heard it before, but we're going to discuss that in our um, kids' church time. And also, if you're at home, I'd love you to read that with your parents and look at the church news, and there'll be some activities and things that you can do around that passage. But you know what? Didn't you have a sheep somewhere? I did have a sheep. I, you know, I have chickens at home, it? but I actually have a little sheep and I don't know where it is. Where's it going? Um, I don't know. Do you guys, can you guys like, well, I don't know. That's what, fine. What do you it? guys have a look for me? Oh, it might be right here. I, I don't know. Well, that's I know sometimes it Phil morning, like huh? maybe takes it and wants to play with it, like takes it out of my I, office. I do like sheep. But he does like <laughs> sheep? <laughs> yeah, we haven't gotten any meat sauce. Oh, oh. no. I have to come over here. I just, I don't know, I have a feeling that I've seen it somewhere around. I just mm. don't know where. Where could it be? Uh, ah! Right behind you, Phil. It's behind you, Phil. <laughs> behind you, Phil. Oh, hi, hi, hi. Oh, Phil. 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 Oh, Phil.
Bell. Are the kids the kids are heading out there yes, now the kids to Kids are. Church? So if you're in the worship centre, you can uh, head out to uh, the program and we'll maybe Lou will actually have the little sheet there and you might do a little bit of hide maybe. and seek. Uh, for a uh, couple of weeks' time, Sunday, November 1 is House Church Sunday again. Uh, so we're really wanting to make sure that everyone is uh, committed to being involved in that. We've had overwhelmingly positive response and feedback uh, to the first one a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're really excited about the opportunities that come up in this one. So Sunday, November the 1st, uh, book it in. And the major question is, who are you inviting? Uh, so we would love people to be opening up their homes. You can go with the same house church as you had last time or mix it up. There were plenty of people away actually last time because it was on the long weekend in the school holidays. So some people said, oh, we can't do it this time. We would love to next time. So make sure you're out there inviting people along uh, and let Gretchen know at the office uh, who you're having at your house or whose house church you're a part of so we can be aware. Uh, and then if you do want to be a part of one but you're not actually sure, whose place to go to, let Gretchen know as well and we can coordinate something. But we would love every single person to be in a house church if they want to be on Sunday, November 1. So book it in. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, there's something else to mention, which is um, a bit of a highlight each year for our young people, for the youth group. Uh, and we weren't sure if it was going to come off this year or not with everything that's happened. Um, but it's very exciting and there is some news. So we're going to watch just a quick little teaser trailer for that. Yes, yeah, so we're very excited about camp happening uh, on the 27th to the 29th of November. So for all of our high schoolers, uh, book it in. Um, actually, numbers are limited this year, so make sure you get in early. Um, find out some more information um, through youth group, or you can get in touch with me about that. A couple of other things are that, yeah, we've got Youth and Thrive starting up this week. Oh, they've already started, yep. in fact, on been Friday on. night. Yeah, they've been and gone. Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we've got them happening again this term on Friday nights. Year fours are welcome at Thrive, and year sixes are welcome at Youth. So some exciting things happening. And Night Church as well will be back tonight. It'll be the first night of a new term of Night Church. Um, sort of a youth, young, adult service um, that, yeah, we'd love for people in those age brackets to be a part of. Terrific. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, and of course, one of the uh, uh, events we haven't been able to have uh, recently has been our encore services, and a lot of people have been missing that because it's one of the highlights of our, of our program. So we put together a, um, a kind of an encore that's going to be a bit different because we still can't sing along, but we're going to have an encore concert. And so that's going to be on the Sunday, the 15th of October. November. November. <laughs> yeah. Don't come on the 15th of October, come on the 15th of November. Yeah. 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 Uh, that'll be 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Be lots of fun and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So make sure you, you come along for that. Yeah. And the other exciting event, of course, is when, which is really the highlight of our whole yeah. church life, yeah. is that we've now reached the soccer finals. Uh, our team played yesterday. Uh, I don't know what the score yeah, is yet, no. but, we, but, but we will know by Sunday. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there, our A grade team, I think, are pretty much guaranteed to be minor premiers, and our, our C grade team will probably run second in their comp. So now we're going into the, to the semi finals. Grand finals will be in uh, three weeks' time. So, uh, mm. so support all, the, all the, uh, the soccer team on that. Congratulations to the, to the players this year who've done very well. Um, I should say that our normal uh, team meetings are really quite serious and well organised. <laughs> we talk about lots of deep and meaningful stuff. Um, but um, now, that you, now that you, but Gretchen's not here, so she's <laughs> yeah. yeah. so yeah. not yeah. keeping us in order. So from this uh, uh, rather uh, exciting team meeting, we're now going to hand over to the worship team for something a bit more serious.
it's time for us now to spend some time with the Lord in prayer. But I wonder how many of you are feeling tired at, at the moment, tired emotionally, spiritually, physically. I have some favourite verses that I just want to read. These are ones that I often go to when I'm feeling really tired. From Isaiah chapter 40. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's pray. Father God, we know that at, at this time many people are feeling very weary. Um, because of the situation of, of this year, it has been an exhausting year for so many. But we thank you that we have a God. We have you who is almighty. You are omnipotent. So you have all the strength that we can draw on. And Father God, we pray that you would help each of us to draw on your strength day by day to find the, the peace and the joy that we need to carry out our daily tasks. And we just want to, to praise you again for the way that you do give us peace, joy, strength, and so much more in our lives. And Lord, we do want to pray especially for our teachers and our students. They've gone back to school again this week. We pray that you would strengthen them day by day. We pray for strength for the teachers as there are various restrictions placed on them. But we, we just ask that you would help them to do their, their job well. We pray that the children would be happy, that they would continue to learn and that you would protect them all. We also pray for our, our church pastoral team. We know that uh, th this year will have been tiring as well as, uh, as they've had to do things in, in different ways, but we, we pray for each one and for our admin team, for our deacons. We pray that you would give them all wisdom as they look to the future and uh, discuss the ways that we can open up safely again. We also pray, Lord, for any unemployed in our church, in our community. We know that there would be many, and we ask that you would provide for them, but also that you would continue to use us as a church to help provide food and support to those within our church and those who are our neighbours. We also would, would pray, Lord, for those who are worried about their finances, mortgages to be paid and so on. And, and we ask again that they would uh, get the right advice for their situations and that they would find peace and provision in you. We also pray, Lord, for our older folk, many of whom have, have not been anywhere much this, this year at all. They've just been staying home and who long to come back to church. We do pray that they might find fellowship with others and we ask that they would be very much aware of you working in their lives and that they would be able to draw on you from your word and in prayer. We also pray for our missionaries and we would pray especially for the Dennis family today as uh, this week they were uh, given the green light to put in their applications for their visas to return overseas. We do pray, Father, that uh, their visas would be granted soon and as, as they go to Asia again uh, to work with the H people, we ask that you would continue to provide for them, prepare them, uh, and that you would take them safely there once again. We do give thanks that Naomi has been able to teach English online during these months and that she has now just completed a, a qualification in doing that and we pray that she will be able to use this when they are back there in Asia. We also would pray, Lord, for our government. We've seen in, in recent weeks that things have been rather messy for some of our 
our governments and the leaders, we do pray that you would continue to give them wisdom as they make decisions that affect all our lives. We just ask that uh, there would be harmony and peace amongst them. And then Lord, we, we just pray again that day by day we would trust in you, that we would draw on you for, for strength, that we would continue to love those around us and that we would reflect your love uh, to everybody that we meet. Thank you for your immense love. Thank you for working in us and we thank you in the name of our wonderful Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus, and turning to them he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, five months ago, I stood in this exact location uh, as we looked at Luke chapter 5, where Jesus first calls his disciples to follow him. Uh, and we've observed, as they've taken the journey since that time, uh, where Jesus has piece by piece shown them what it means to follow him. Uh, he's called them to join him in uh, becoming fishers of people, uh, that they would draw men and women uh, to God. Uh, he's called them to live out revolutionary new ethics, the ethics of the kingdom of God, uh, of love for enemies, of, of taking the speck out of uh, the, the log out of your own eye before the speck in someone else's, uh, of leaving a place of honour at the table for somebody else. Uh, he's revealed that the life of a follower is one of humility, of service, of peace, of generosity and faith. He has sent them out town by town with nothing uh, and just depending simply on the provision of God uh, and he has made it clear that in order to follow him they must put aside the distractions and excuses that threaten to pull them away telling them that they must deny themselves take up their cross and follow him now when you think about it Jesus is doing a terrible job at selling discipleship to those followers. You see, in our market-driven economy, you generally lower the cost of something and uh, spruik or, or uh, trumpet the benefits of something in order to get people to, to buy in. Uh, it's like a car. If you're selling a car, you say, you know, we've, we've made it cheaper, we've dropped the price, and yet we've added these features to make it more appealing to you. But throughout his ministry, Jesus does the exact opposite. He raises the cost. He makes it extraordinarily difficult and increases the demands. And he makes it seem less and less appealing every time as to what it means to follow him. And yet, despite this, large crowds continue to follow him around. So they just don't seem to get it. 
And so Jesus makes just about the most shocking claim yet in his entire ministry. And we find it in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 onwards. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his mother and father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now this sounds pretty full on, doesn't it? Well, it was just as shocking, if not more so, for those who were listening to Jesus that day. You see, in that culture, family was the most sacred of bonds. Of course, it is for most of us today as well. Uh, I'm sure most of us couldn't even imagine, couldn't even think of something that would make us disloyal or abandon our family. It's beyond comprehension. And that was especially so for Middle Eastern culture at the time of Jesus. So Jesus is deliberately trying to shock his audience. He wants people listening to him that day to uh, absolutely be abhorred by what Jesus is saying. He's not literally wanting them to hate their father and mother because that would be in opposition, contradiction to the fifth commandment. So Jesus is not telling them to do that. He's using hyperbole to indicate the type of commitment that is required to be a follower. Essentially, he's saying, your loyalty, devotion and commitment to me must be so great that it would seem as if you hate your family. Or as the saying goes, Jesus first, daylight second. It has to be that clear in regards to how devoted you are to me. And so he goes on to explain why this is the case. In verse 28, he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to complete it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Jesus uses this example to show the importance of counting the cost before we start something. He's telling these people who are interested in following him that it's going to be expensive. It's going to cost a lot. In fact, it will actually cost some of them their family and even potentially their lives. And so he's telling them to count the cost before they even start. Because the last thing he wants is people who claim to follow him get halfway through but can't pay the price when the time comes. He doesn't want fair weather friends. You see, some people incorrectly interpret this as Jesus saying, you have to hate your mother and father and brother and sister in order to qualify to be my disciple. You know, like he lines up and say, do you hate your father and mother? Yes, okay, you can be. Do you? No, you don't know, you can't be. That's not what's going on here. Jesus is saying, if you are going to survive as my disciple, if you're going to endure as a follower of mine, you need uncompromising loyalty and devotion to me, even more than you do for your family, which is top of the tree. See, Jesus is encouraging us to have strong family relationships. He wants us to be devoted, but not more devoted to our family than to him. So this isn't about what it takes to qualify as a disciple. This is what it takes to endure as a disciple. You see, we're all going to face consequences of following Jesus at some point. It's unlikely in our culture that we'll say, face the same uh, threats as they did of, of paying the price of our own lives or our, of our own follow, our family for following Jesus. But there will be a cost somewhere along the line. And if our highest devotion is placed somewhere other than Jesus, then we will inevitably fall short when the time of testing comes. I mean, think about the rich young ruler who wanted to follow Jesus, uh, but he went away sad because Jesus called him to sell his possessions and give to the poor. He wanted to follow Jesus, but he wasn't willing to pay the price. Or what about the man who wanted to bury his father 
before then following Jesus? Or what about Judas Iscariot, who was so in love with 30 pieces of silver that he was willing to betray Jesus? Or Simon Peter, who feared for his personal safety enough to deny Jesus? Following Jesus will inevitably involve cost and sacrifice in both big and small ways. And unless we have Jesus first and daylight second, then we will inevitably find ourselves in the same position at some point of wanting to follow Jesus, but failing to have what it takes because we love something or someone else more. And in verse 34, Jesus explains what the end result of this is. In verse 34, he says, salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. So imagine for a moment you've got some salt. And imagine that the salt has lost its saltiness. So that when you pour it on your food, it doesn't enhance the flavour at all. It doesn't make a difference. It's kind of pointless, isn't it? Why bother? It doesn't accomplish what it was intended to do. Likewise, imagine a Christian that loses their passion and devotion to Jesus as Lord. Other people will think, well, what's the point? Why bother? Like when we put our jobs and lifestyles as higher priority than Jesus, why would anyone think it's worthwhile following him? when we put so much money into our mortgages and, and home renovations that we can't respond with generosity to the needs of others, why would anyone else think that Jesus has compassion on the poor? And when we spend so much time talking about ourselves rather than having ears to listen to others, why would anyone think that Jesus wants to hear what's going on for them? When we have other things in our lives that are more important than Jesus, then we undermine our witness to him as Lord. We accomplish nothing. And so Jesus wants us all to know what following him involves. It means counting the cost. It means being prepared to surrender all for his purposes. It means having nothing as higher priority than him. Otherwise, we're like salt that doesn't make a difference. And Jesus knows that this is a big call. Our initial response is to think, I don't like the sound of this. But he's not willing to compromise. He finishes off this section saying a simple sentence with profound meaning. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. In other words, this is the way it is. Take it or leave it. Well, over the past five months, we've consistently heard Jesus raise the bar when it comes to discipleship. Sadly, what we've done as the church in the West is the opposite. We have followed the lead of our market economy and we've lowered the cost of discipleship and highlighted the benefits in order to sell it to people. As the church in the West, we've, we've often said, we'll make church fit your schedule so it's not too much of an imposition on your lifestyle. But that's not all. We'll also package it with your preferred taste in music and coffee. We're lowering the cost and raising, spruiking the benefits. We've said things like, We'll put the Bible on an app so you don't have to go to the trouble of carrying around a real one or even look like you're reading it while you're on the train. But that's not all. We'll also throw in some bespoke daily devotions tailored to you so you don't even have to do the work of opening the Bible and studying it for yourself. And we've said things like, we're a church that never mentions sin or repentance or obedience. We don't expect you to do the hard work of changing your life. 
But that's not all. We'll talk all the time about how God loves you more than anything and is just always available for you no matter what and just wants to bless you and make you prosperous and victorious. We've gone wrong somewhere, haven't we? When we try to sell Jesus or sell Christianity to someone by lowering the cost and spruiking the benefits. Because Jesus never, ever did that. And I don't want us at Greenpoint to do that either. I don't want us to ever portray discipleship differently to how Jesus did. I don't want us to pander to the consumerism of our time and lower the bar of what is required to follow Jesus and just spruik all the wonderful, positive things that are available if you believe. Yes, there are wonderful things available for those who believe, but it is hard work. There is cost involved and Jesus is uncompromising in his call to discipleship and obedience. Perhaps that's why the church in the West is so irrelevant and ineffectual. We've turned discipleship into something very different than what Jesus had intended. I wonder if you put yourself in this biblical narrative through the journey we've taken over the past five months. If you were one of the people following Jesus around and, and listening to him state what we need to lay down in order to follow him, what would he identify for you? What threatens to topple him of highest place of priority in your life? What price might you be unwilling to pay? The answer to those questions is what is holding you back from the being the disciple that Jesus calls you to be. Remember, Jesus first, daylight second. Considering all he's done for us, he deserves nothing less, does he? As this final song is played for us, I encourage you to reflect on what Jesus has said here and take this opportunity to once again devote yourself wholly to him. And we'll see you in Courtyard Cafe shortly.
We are indeed blessed to be able to be together and to listen to good teaching and to be challenged by the things that God is speaking into our lives. I really encourage you, if you're doing church this morning with anybody else, take the time to have a chat, speak a little bit more in depth about what you've heard. And also don't forget, it's time for a chat afterwards in the cafe. See you later.